Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Michael Millerman, millermanschool.com. And today we're going to do our Tuesday morning article live stream. A couple of articles here that I want to go over with you. The first is on the political discourse of fitness. And the other one has to do with enchantment and disenchantment of modern society. So we'll begin with this one. By challenging our physical bodies, we may heal our civic ones. This is published at noemamag.com, N-O-E-M-A-M-A-G.com, noemamag. And you know, this is a crucial topic in today's political discourse, because on one hand, you have the theme of the emasculation of men and the longhouse effect and everybody becoming <clears throat> weak and, uh, and effeminate. And also the idea that physical exercise and uh, martial arts are a sign of you know, right wing uh, latent fascism or whatever the case is. So let's see this article. Do we have a patriotic duty to get off our couches and exercise? <clears throat> By Colm O'Shea. This is again, Noema Mag. Now let's go. In 1819, philologist and theologian Friedrich Ludwig Jan was jailed by Prussian authorities. His crime wasn't uh, suspect theological treatises, but teaching gymnastics and calisthenics. Despite his relative obscurity in the annals of history, Jan invented much of what is regarded today as modern gymnastics, systematizing elements like the vaulting horse, rings, and balance beam that grace mainstream television screens every four years during the Olympics. How his instruction of formal exercise became so frightening to local authorities is worth examining in our time. Since the Enlightenment, Educational reformers had sought to revive the Greek gymnastic ideal, summarized by the Roman poet Juvenal as mens sana in corpore seno, a healthy mind in a healthy body. As a result, European gymnastics had slowly been evolving, vaguely linked with the moral development of the young. Jan inherited this tradition being a secondary school teacher, but since he was also a fervent patriot and veteran, he saw gymnastics as a crucible to forge a sense of solidarity and civic duty in the general population, brooding on Napoleon's shattering of Germany into a series of loosely connected states ruled by autocrats. Jan became obsessed with the notion that Teutonic youth lacked the deep psychophysical resources necessary to hold their national sovereignty intact. Like a 19th century Tyler Durden, he set about creating a series of clubs for practicing gymnasts and became known as the Turnvater. So the clubs is Turnverein, the practicing gymnastics is Turnen. So he became known as the Turnvater, the father of the gymnasts, partially because of his apparatus and technique innovations, but more so his paternal investment in his students' moral development. We don't have a video of how Jan conducted himself, but he must have been formidably charismatic because cal calisthenics evolved over the decades to become something of a cult for both the working and middle classes, promoting physical skill and strength along with tactical virtues like large group organization. <clears throat> Open air clubs, Turnplatz, uh, were guided by the four F's in German, which translated roughly to hardy, pious, cheerful, free. The German gymnasts were also unusual for their time as they eventually encompassed both men and women in their ranks. A political liberal with nationalistic fervor Jan demanded freedom of speech and a unified Germany, free from foreign influences, such as the control it faced under the First French Empire. Okay, let me just pause here for a minute. So this is an old topic in the history of classical republicanism, that on one hand, you want your people to be free from foreign oppression, and that on the other hand, to accomplish that, there must be gymnastic training. That is an old idea. You can find that, for instance, in Plato's Laws, where gymnastic forms a key component of the education of the citizens together with music. So back to the article, his devoted following was overtly political. Jan framed their physical training as preparation to fight foes, foreign or domestic, if needs be. You know, like, what are you going to do if uh, you have Antifa riots domestically or if you have some sort of barbarian invaders at the gates? Well, you better know how to fight. <clears throat> or you better know how to uh, defend yourself in some other way. Prussia's conservative aristocratic regime saw Jan's young gymnastic acolytes as a threat. They were bohemian and emphasized the informal fraternal du form of address as opposed to the formal z when speaking German. Worse, they demanded a representational government, a constitution, a unified Germany, and universal suffrage for landowners. 
Prussian authorities implemented the Carlsbad decrees, which created a police state, censored the press, and involved heavy surveillance of oppositional movements. Jan was arrested, and the regime implemented a ban on gymnastics that remained in place in most of Prussia until it was lifted by Prussia's King Frederick William IV in 1842. So this guy was arrested. His new gymnastic uh, training is banned. And there we take up the story. When Jan was released six years later, he was forbidden from living anywhere near a secondary school or university. All gymnastic activities were moved indoors to small, more carefully controlled gyms, presumably to break up the rally-like mass meetings and alter the political gymnastic culture. Okay, let me just remind you. Uh, well, you may know if you read about the quote-unquote alt-right and the culture wars, how often physical fitness today is coded as an anti-liberal phenomenon. So that's, again, one of the reasons why I thought this would be interesting for us to read. The visionary and incendiary elements of Jan's nationalistic impulses couldn't be fully sieved out, however, and gymnasts were disproportionately represented among revolutionaries fighting in the revolutions of 1848-49, which were broadly concerned with curbing monarchy and uniting Germany under a representative government. Middle-class acolytes tended to focus on liberal principles, such as freedom of the press, while the working class demanded more radical changes to brutal living and working conditions that were made famous in the writings of Marx and Engels. Both men witnessed and wrote extensively on the 1848 uprisings. <clears throat> Divided by competing class goals, these revolutionaries were ultimately defeated by the aristocratic regime and forced into exile. Many fled to Australia, the United Kingdom, and the U.S., where they became known as the 48ers, the U.S. settlers established themselves from Wisconsin to Texas, where they founded gymnastic clubs called Turner Societies, or Turnverein, Turnverein along with many civic-minded institutions such as public libraries, community firefighting groups, and labor unions. Many Turnin, many of these gymnasts, became abolitionists, uh, excuse me, abolitionists in America, fighting as Union soldiers in the Civil War and serving as bodyguards at Lincoln's inaugural and his funeral. Then there's this quote here, this tendency to understand physical fitness as a personal pursuit akin to a hobby and unconnected to the civic body is exceedingly modern and almost amnesiac. You know, in other words, it forgets the classical Republican roots in some sense of gymnastic training, which I mentioned you see in Plato's laws, but also in Plato's Republic and in other classical sources. Today, gymnastics is characterized by its attention to precision, clean form and military decorum. One might never suspect its colorful revolutionary history. In fact, we have moved so far from Jan's reality over the past two centuries that the regime's response to his activities seems almost farcical. This tendency to understand physical fitness as a personal pursuit, here's that quote, akin to a hobby and unconnected to the civic body, is exceedingly modern and almost amnesiac. Jan may have systematized calisthenics for a modern era, but as far back as the ancient Greeks, gymnastics was practiced as a discipline and understood not only as a physical system of conditioning, but one of moral education and even ethical dedication to the state. This ethical training dimension of gymnastics is why it was promoted by social reformers at Harvard University, notably by the scholar Charles Beck, who was a disciple and translator of Jan's gymnastic treaties. Upon arriving from Germany to Massachusetts, Beck became the first physical education teacher in America Oh, that's interesting, the first phys ed teacher in the U.S. and taught the nation's first gymnastics classes at the Round Hill School in Northampton in 1825. Although it was a short-lived experimental school, the idea of educating the whole person via movement training made a profound impression on the New England elite. Let me just pause here for a minute. I had a flashback <clears throat> just now, remembering sitting in school, probably, I don't know, grade four, grade five, something like that. And we were watching a video, 10, 15 minutes, it's always nice when you could watch a video in class because it's, you know, lights out. Um, you can sort of tune out if you wanted to. But this particular memory that I have, they were showing a video of the horrors of the 20th century, which of course means also and especially for the educational system, the Nazis. And one of the things that I most remember is, you know, a bunch of young boys doing gymnastic training. That's like part of the, if you think, I mean, there are many things you think about when you think about the Nazis, but one of the images that I very distinctly remember sitting in class and seeing that video was like, oh, you know, they wanted to raise a generation of good, strong, fit young men. And then, you know, if you do that, 
you're going to become, uh, you know, what the, what, the, uh, what the Nazis became. Anyway, just sharing with you a quick flashback I had there. So the concept of superior athletic discipline equating to civilizational superiority would later take hold in the Cold War competition for Olympic medals between the Soviets and the West. By the way, thank you for being here. My name is Michael Millerman. We're reading Noema Mag, N-O-E-M-A, M-A-G dot com. This article called By Challenging Our Physical Bodies, We May Heal Our Civic Ones, Our Civic Bodies. Over recent decades, this concept has lost what purchase it once had on the public imagination. Since the military draft was phased out in 1973, the percentage of Americans with a personal or family connection to the military has steadily shrunk, particularly among the young. Following the fall of the Berlin Wall, Olympic contests, including in gymnastics, lost much of their political charge, although there remains a chilly edge to gymnastic competitions along ideological lines. Generations, especially in many Western nations like the United States, have grown up without the expectation that they will be called to defend their country in a large-scale war. Just pause for a minute. I'm thinking sort of, you know, sports do still play a political role today, but mostly they're the arena for the gender wars, you know, the question whether women should be allowed to compete with men. Uh, in some cases, I think they are pointed to, are they not, correct me if I'm wrong here, as a sign of the decline of American dominance, for example, with the influx of great uh, European ballers in the NBA. So there's still something of that political dimension there, but not like if you go to sports, you're training for war. A culture war obviously not being the same as a full-blown foreign war. All right, to continue, now this may be changing. With Russia and possibly China moving to expand their borders and the race for AI supremacy instilling an atmosphere of deep uncertainty, messaging from top military personnel in the West has shifted dramatically from its long post-war slumber to something more like pre-war prep. Fitness in the sense of readiness for real physical challenge and hardship may once again become a necessity for citizens in the industrialized world. Now, I just want to share with you I have a person who studies with me at Millerman School in private tutoring. And, um, you know, we've had occasion to talk about this because we both train jiu-jitsu. And, you know, I trained it because I didn't want to go into my 40s without any physical exercise. And he trains it, you know, for that and other reasons, but largely and increasingly, if I'm not mistaken, out of a sense of this sort of thesis here, that fitness in the sense of readiness for a real, for real physical challenge and hardship may once again become a necessity for citizens of the industrialized world. You know, what are you going to do? Like I say, if you have uh, Antifa comes up to you as you're having dinner with your girlfriend and there's a big mob there, I don't know, can you fight them off if you know some jujitsu or if you've done some boxing or whatever the case is, but maybe they're less likely to approach you and you can put them in their place. What if you have to be ready for war with Russia and China? You can't be a fat, lazy slob. This winter, British General Patrick Sanders suggested that all citizens of the United Kingdom, not just those in its military service, should be prepared for the possibility of a land war in the coming years. Ukraine, he says here, brutally illustrates that regular armies start wars, citizen armies win them. Also referring to Russian aggression, Dutch Admiral Rob Bauer, the NATO military committee chief, publicly noted that in the event of a land war, quote, it is the whole of society that will get involved whether we like it or not, unquote. Some readers may bristle at these warnings, considering them alarmism or jingoist rhetoric from Western military leaders. But the renewed threat of war, whether with China, Russia, Iran, or forces unknown, should remind us of a fundamental question, what is worth protecting? Here, George Orwell, in his notes on nationalism, creates a vital distinction, quoting now George Orwell, nationalism is not to be confused with patriotism. Both words are normally used in so vague a way that any definition is liable to be challenged, but one must distinguish between them since two different and even opposing ideas are involved. By patriotism, I, meaning George Orwell, mean devotion to a particular place and a particular way of life, which one believes to be the best in the world, but has no wish to force on other people. Patriotism is of its nature defensive, both militarily and culturally. Nationalism, on the other hand, is inseparable from the desire for power. With typical acidity, the author continues, Orwell adds, quote, in societies such as ours, it is unusual for anyone describable as an intellectual to feel a very deep attachment to his own country. Public opinion, that is the section of public opinion of which he as an intellectual is aware, will not allow him to do so. 
Can we pause for a minute before we continue on Orwell and Orwell's estimation of civic pride? First of all, you see here, you've got the distinction between nationalism and patriotism. Nationalism, in a sense, being offensive, inseparable from the desire for power. Patriotism being defensive, devotion to a particular, a defensive devotion to a particular place and a particular way of life. Uh, it's complicated, isn't it? I mean, it's not so straightforward. I'll give you an example. Here's a book called The Sovereign Individual, Mastering the Transition to the Information Age. I've been reading this because there are people who have come to study with me at Millerman School who are into Bitcoin and cryptography and, you know, they think that we're in an important phase transition in world history and monetary history and legal history and all of that. And they say this book is a good description of that transition process. Uh, and one of the things here that these authors describe, and you got to try to try to think about where they fit into the equation, uh, they say that, look, attachment to place is a relic of the industrial age. And that as you move to the information age, you have a kind of uprooting, but in a good way. People are no longer bound to the place where they were born for their economic sustenance, for their loyalties. They have more uh, virtual mobility and so on because of the changing economic conditions introduced by the power of the microprocessor. And so there's a question, um, what is the relationship of our selves and our place? You know, it's one thing for Heidegger, if you talk about, um, you know, different philosophers have different attitudes and different thoughts, different attitudes towards and different thoughts about the meaning of place for the person, okay? Uh, devotion to a particular place in a particular way of life, to what extent is that rooted in what's essential for the human being? To what extent is it a function of a previous mode of economic organization? And uh, can you even make this distinction in the way that Orwell did when he did between nationalism and patriotism? All kinds of things to consider, but let's go on further in the article. So civic pride in Orwell's estimation is not seen as morally sophisticated, Yet Orwell, whose left-wing bona fides are robust, was willing to aver his own civic pride and love of country. Perhaps his concept of defensive patriotism can be the starting point for a consideration of whether our 21st century populace, used to physical and material comfort, has retained a willingness for civic sacrifice to support what Sanders called a whole-of-nation undertaking requiring bodily fitness. So I'll just pause again. I've got people that I follow on, uh, on Twitter you know, some of them were former members of the Trump administration, for instance. And at times, what they'll do is they'll post pictures of the U.S. military leadership, you know, dressed in drag or whatever the case is, like not inspiring your full loyalty and devotion, and say, uh, who's going to fight for this army? Now, no disrespect to anybody who's currently in the armed forces, needless to say. The point is, there's a kind of thought that if the army does not represent a defensive patriotism, if it does not properly reflect devotion to a particular place and a, and a particular way of life, but if it sort of makes a mockery of that place and a mockery of that way of life, and it becomes degenerate and serves something other than genuine civil loyalty, then there is a question about whether it can command the, um, you know, whether it can command the power of life and death willingly over its citizen body. Whereas you have other cases maybe Bukela and El Salvador, I don't know, uh, who actually inspires a defensive patriotism because the country is somehow aligned with the uh, values and virtues and visions that make a country great. Well, I don't know. You can let me know what you think about all of that. Let's go back to the article. Uh, I'm not going to read. Actually, yeah, let's read this quote. As far back as the ancient Greeks, gymnastics was practiced as a discipline understood not only as a physical system of conditioning, but one of moral education and even ethical dedication to the state as we saw, except more correctly here, to the polis. Okay, not to the state, because it's a little bit different. So, Socrates and street workout culture, continuing the article. Over the last few decades, a new competitive form of calisthenics, sometimes called a street workout, has burgeoned globally, especially in Eastern and Western Europe and North America. It even has its own governing body, established in 2011, the World Street Workout and Calisthenics Federation. Never heard of that. A kind of pared-down version of gymnastics, it is primarily performed in free open-air spaces like public parks, playgrounds, or anywhere there are overhead bars to hang from. Let me pause here. I do incidentally think in the design of cities, there should be way more overhead bars for people to hang from so that 
not only kids have their playgrounds where they can go down the slide and monkey bars and the you know swings but there should be all over the city places where adults can stop and do their uh, you know pull-ups and dips and all of that i think that would be a good thing to encourage maybe in your cities i don't know in miami wherever uh, you're listening from do they have these a lot of uh, adult exercise stations out and about in the city where i am in montreal there are one or two Participants range in age from young teens to a few masters in their 40s and 50s and are mostly self-taught with little to no formal training in the traditional Olympic-style gymnastics. Fueled by online videos of increasingly impressive physical exploits, this calisthenics community has set about establishing its own training methodology, rules, and competitive categories. The internet, with its forums for research and discussion on best practices for technique, nutrition, sleep, and other factors, has fueled a dramatic rate of athletic innovation. Moves that once seemed impossible have become standard in a handful of years, and this without much in the way of top-down organization or monetary investment. Speaking personally, writes the author, I have long been fascinated and inspired by this sudden sport, especially by its minimalism. It can sprout up anywhere with few requirements in terms of equipment or environment. Perhaps, oh, someone wrote about the Soviet Union. Here's a paragraph on the Soviet Union. Perhaps as a cultural holdover from the Soviet era's focus on gymnastics, former Soviet bloc countries tend to produce especially impressive amateur calisthenic athletes. Among these nations, Ukraine has stood out as producing some of the best. And then the author says, Google Ukrainian street workout to see what I mean. So if you want to do that, go ahead. Before the Russian invasion in 2022, I routinely bored my wife with YouTube videos of Ukrainian calisthenic virtuosity. It must be something in the drinking water over there, I joked. After Russia's invasion, the Ukrainian commitment to general physical preparedness riveted the world's attention in a new and sobering way. As photographs of Ukrainian civilians receiving crash course training and handling firearms appeared on the pages of American newspapers, I, writes the author, was not alone in my awe. Here was a people confronted with the starkest physical realities imaginable, rising to meet the moment. Exercise for me is a deeply personal pleasure, and in those Ukrainian street workout videos, I'd always seen people taking a similar pleasure in not just moving, but also improving themselves. Now I saw something else, okay, meaning like preparation for the battle that lies ahead. Here, uh, I remember, I did not read this article before getting on with you, and I'm very happy to see a mention of Xenophon and Xenophon's memorabilia, because it's always great when we can be reminded of Socrates. In Xenophon's memorabilia, Socrates admonishes a young man, Epigenes, to get in shape. Epigenes shrugs off Socrates' advice to strengthen himself on the grounds that he, Epigenes, is not an athlete. <clears throat> Socrates lets him have it, quoting now Xenophon writing so- Socrates' dialogue to Epigenes. Quote, it is a disgrace to grow old through sheer carelessness before seeing what manner of man you may become by developing your bodily strength and beauty to their highest limit. But you cannot see that if you are careless, for it will not come of its own accord. End quote. Very great stuff there as usual from Socrates. Make sure, you know, if you take one thing away from this video, take away an interest in Socrates, which you get not only from Plato, but also from Xenophon and a third ancient source, Aristophanes, who has a play in which Socrates is the main character called The Clouds. Okay, one second here. Let me just catch my breath. Good to be with you. We are reading this article about challenging our physical bodies and healing our civic bodies. I see some of you are active in the chat. I appreciate that. Hope you are enjoying this. The ancient Greeks, much like modern Ukrainians, had compelling reason to build outdoor training areas and promote a gymnastic culture of strength and competition. The wolves were always at their door, the calamity of invasion ever present. Socrates' advice to Epigenes starts out with this pragmatic consideration. Just because the state doesn't force you to train doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. If conflict breaks out, fitter specimens have a better chance of survival and, incidentally, of helping their comrades. This, you might say, is the most basic, most primal rationale to stay in shape and conditioned. Soft people get crushed in an emergency. Socrates adds another layer, a plea to intellectual ambition. If you want to be good at thinking, you'd do well to condition your body. 
But his final, it's his final admonition quoted above about seeing what manner of man you may become if you challenge yourself physically. That captures my imagination most because it applies to almost everyone today. No matter our age, sex, or station in life, what might any of us become if we set our own contests with the physical world on our own terms and pursued them rigorously? Following from that, what would our greater civic body look and feel like if most citizens were on such a curious quest as Socrates implores Epigenes to embrace? Okay, good questions there as we move on to the next section called the Ethics of Physical Literacy. The moment one links duty to the state with physical culture, of course, the red flags begin to wave, as we talked about earlier in the article. Jan was a virulent anti-Semite, and it's hard not to hear echoes of his ethno-nationalism in the sinister concept of Hitler's Aryan athletic ideal paraded to the world in the propaganda of Lenny Riefenstahl's Olympia, which maybe is what we watched in that classroom way back in the day. In contemporary America, Christopher Mulvey writes about doing anthropology fieldwork at Barbell Strength Tribe, which he claims, quote, smashes fascist politics and the body together by relentlessly linking bodily strength to human worth. Most, most pronounced was the hatred of beta males, who untrained or incorrectly trained and lured into crippling dependencies by the creature comforts and conveniences of modern society, fail to meet the gym standard for white men. Denouncing the weakness emblematized by contemporary man buns and yoga pants, the tribe laments the degeneracy of these beta males. The health and well-being championed by functional fitness mean little when put up against the real reasons for proper athletic effort, strengthening the body to meet the threats of the current world, and creating the possibility of a quote-unquote new United States founded on renewed masculine strength. On this view, a fascist orientation to the world makes sense. If white masculinity is in danger of dilution, all available methods must be undertaken to save it, beginning with the process of stealing the body from contaminating weakness. Unquote. Cynthia Miller Idris, a professor in the School of Public Affairs and the School of Education at the American University, where she heads the Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab, conveniently uh, uh, with the convenient acronym that you see there, PERIL, also makes this connection between the trained body and ideological purification. Quote, physical fitness has always been central to the far right. In Mein Kampf, Hitler fixated on boxing and jiu-jitsu, believing they could help him create an army of millions whose aggressive spirit and impeccably trained bodies, combined with fanatical love of the fatherland, would do more for the German nation than any mediocre tactical weapons training. Unquote. Wherever a threat of ideological recruitment into genuine ethno-state fascism exists, it must be taken seriously, writes the author. The danger of this dynamic arising in martial arts and strength training should be continually alive to us. But that can't be an excuse to ignore the far more pervasive danger and the inarguable cost of sedentary living. By and large, the clearly established health risks of not moving enough are downplayed out of what we might call politeness, right? You wouldn't want to offend anybody by calling them a lazy, ad, <laughs> a lazy person. Uh, perhaps inevitably, the multi-billion dollar fitness industry, which exploits our self-critical impulses without delivering much demonstrable improvement in actual fitness, has generated a backlash. By the way, you guys should write here in the chat, in the comments, you know, what's your thought on all of this, on the physical fitness, the importance of it for life in general? Uh, what about the importance of it for civic duty, for finding out what kind of man you can become? Is that necessarily going to be related to patriotism and to um, all kinds of civic issues? Or can it just be something you do in order to be a good uh, mother, father, you know, brother, son, make sure that you are in good health for a long time? That doesn't have to be something you do for the sake of the state, does it? It can be something you do, but maybe it should be something you do for the sake of the state. Think about it. The body positivity movement at its best is an antidote to the endless demand that we all participate in a perpetual low-grade beauty parade. We can instead accept who we are, it avers, and maybe even learn to love ourselves. But in the hands of certain extremists, the moral imperative to empathize with struggles of self-esteem becomes a cudgel. To some, any statement affirming the value of a balanced diet or regular exercise is insensitive healthism. Uh, in such a situation, Epigenes can simply turn and berate Socrates for body shaming him. Why should he explore what he's capable of? Why can't he just accept and love what he is? <clears throat> 
What's most offensive about commercial fitness messaging, I'd contend, writes the author, is its fixation on vanity and self-regard. It encourages us to compare ourselves to models, celebrities, and professional athletes with inevitably discouraging results. Public health messaging, meanwhile, tends to glaze eyeballs with its blandness. I know I'll stave off heart disease if I watch less Netflix, so what? Socrates' fitness as duty has the advantage of being both community-minded and exciting. So, okay, you see here, on one hand, you have commercial fitness messaging, but it's too focused on vanity and self-regard. On the other hand, you have public health messaging, but it's too bland, as you well know. So we find the solution, as we often do, in Socrates' suggestion. Socrates' fitness as duty, which has the advantage of being both community-minded and exciting. Or at least it has the potential to be exciting if we're not put off by the aesthetics of words like duty. In Chuck Klosterman's collection of essays, Sex, Drugs, and Cocoa Puffs, he poses a hypothetical question to his friends. Faced with a choice between dating a person who is attractive and successful or another person who is equally attractive and successful but also extremely patriotic, which would you choose? Overwhelmingly, his friends preferred option A. Why, Klosterman wondered in the essay, should categorical love of country be a deal breaker to his college-educated, urban, left-leaning friends? Patriotism too, uh, excuse me, patriotism too often conjures tribal associations, what Orwell considers the ugly us-them logic of nationalism. There's something unsophisticated to a lot of urbane people about the patriotic, their parochial, uncosmopolitan, deeply uncool. But the events of the last several years have spurred awareness of how quickly things can break down at any moment. Supply chains are vulnerable. Public order is more fragile than we often suppose. Whether we have the luxury of dismissing patriotism on the knee-jerk grounds we might have invoked when Klosterman's book was published almost two decades ago is far from clear. And in a fragmented public, one roiling with ideological divisions and subsumed by competing and increasingly incoherent notions of quote-unquote identity, reaffirming our allegiance to a greater civic body might just be the boring, unsexy reintegration we sorely need. Here, the advice of Socrates to find out what might be possible if only one got sufficiently curious about one's psychophysical limits may align with the self-respect that comes paradoxically from putting away self-concern and aiming to contribute to the well-being of the state. Not everyone can or should commit to being a cop, firefighter, or emergency responder, much less a soldier. For reasons ranging from the pragmatic to the personal, most people are not cut out for physically heroic action, but our culture presumes that everyone is cut out for basic literacy. To be illiterate is effectively to be cut out of so many aspects of social life and robbed of potential intellectual freedom to such a degree that it's considered an injustice. In a similar but arguably more fundamental way, our increasingly sedentary citizenry needs to learn how to use their bodies well from an early age. This entails developing a curiosity about and pleasure from our capacity for complex movement. There's a quiet form of excellence waiting to be recognized by becoming curious about what you can do when you select your own challenges versus demanding that no external force demand anything of you. I mean, it's very hard, isn't it, not to agree with this, especially if you've already done some physical exercise and you know what it means to overcome your own limitations in that regard. And while it's a fraught subject, I'd argue this is even more true for those with physical disability. The general human goal must surely be to improve from your starting position, whatever that may be. Paralympics and the various provisions made for wheelchair athletes and marathons are a good start. Real physical education means learning to optimize movement capacity for each specific and unique human body with its various strengths and inevitable limitations. Guys, one thing I just crossed my mind, I'll figure I'll put it out there. If you're reading this and you're inspired by this and you're going to take on some new physical activity or exercise, put it in the chat, put it in the comments. What's it going to be? I just started snowboarding. Okay. I'm over 40. I just started snowboarding, so it can be done. Uh, Niels Poss, another calisthenics and gymnastics instructor who along with Jan's acolytes influenced the Boston health reform movement in the 1800s, made the argument for what might be called a form of physical literacy. That, like academic literacy, was a fundamental right, albeit one that required some initial discipline to acquire. One that required some initial discipline to acquire. In his book, The Swedish System of Educational Gymnastics, Posse argued that discipline should not be restricted to the military, but rather required of everyone to demonstrate the virtue of self-control. 
This could be done without, as he put it, any encroachment upon the pupil's rights as a free citizen of a free country. For only those who know what restriction means can truly appreciate liberty and make good use of it. This is a common insight from Socrates to Jan Tapasi. The freedom that comes from education is a right to pursue, but it's also a duty to acquire. President John F. Kennedy took up this refrain when he said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Kennedy was not advocating for mindless patriotism, but pointing to a profound relationship between rights and responsibilities. Civic systems that serve us improve primarily through people investing in their personal efforts. In the pages of Sports Illustrated in 1960, around the peak of the Red Scare, Kennedy wrote The Soft American, an article that outlined a general anxiety over European children radically outperforming their American counterparts in calisthenics. Strikingly, he, re he reiterates what Xenophon's Socrates says about the relation of the state to the physically engaged citizen. Just before I read that, you know that uh, Robert uh, F. Kennedy, who's running as an independent, is he not, in the presidential election at the moment he is among other things famous for you know being buff and working out on the beach and all of that so in his own way continuing this um continuing this tradition of putting an emphasis on physical excellence no matter what so strikingly um jfk reiterates what xenophon Socrates says about the relation of the state to the physically engaged citizen quote no matter how vigorous the leadership of any government we can fully restore the physical soundness of our nation if only every American is willing to assume responsibility for his own fitness and the fitness of his children. We do not live in a regimented society where men are forced to live their lives in the interest of the state. We are, after all, excuse me, we are, all of us, as free to direct the activities of our bodies as we are to pursue the objects of our thought. But if we are to retain this freedom for ourselves and for generations to come, then we must also be willing to work for the physical toughness on which the courage and intelligence and skill of man so largely depend. Okay, that was John F. Kennedy. The upshot of this general anxiety around the lack of physical competence was Eisenhower's presidential fitness test. Initiated in 1957, it was a set of benchmarks that measured school children's upper and lower body strength and endurance through basic exercises, pull-ups, push-ups, uh, sit-ups, shuttle run, broad jump, and a softball throw for distance. Ultimately discontinued by President Obama, the test was not without its critics. Many people harbored a lifelong anxiety around the fitness test. I wonder, those of you watching, listening, uh, did any of you have to go through that test? And do you remember that test? The takeaway consensus seems to be that the nation's gym teachers were not properly trained to produce the desired changes in aerobic capacity or core strength that the test was designed to measure. I didn't grow up in America, writes the author, but I too have vivid memories dating to my boyhood in Ireland of the sinking feeling prompted by the mere word gym. Gym class didn't feel like an education so much as a simple sorting of the physically competent haves, I think the Kennedys tossing the football around their compound on Cape Cod, versus the have-nots who lived in urban areas with little to no green or dedicated outdoor recreation space. It was the opposite of empowering. I didn't want to go through life clumsy and weak, and so, with my mother's blessing, I took a year out of school at 16, joined a gymnastics club, and finally learned how to use my body effectively. The result of that decision and investment in my physical self, writes the author, was a lifetime fascination with exploratory physical play, one that continues to pay dividends into my 40s. One second, guys. Give me one second, and I will be right back. <clears throat> I know that not everyone has the time or resources to make such a dramatic commitment to physical education, the author continues. However, when I think of Jan's gymnastics cult with their motto of hardy, pious, cheerful, free, I'm struck by how many contemporary Americans, perhaps those in their prime most of all, seem to feel the opposite, fragile, nihilistic, depressed, trapped. To be clear, our economy can place serious demands on people to be highly sedentary. Office workers and truck drivers, for example, don't have a lot of leeway. Low-income citizens living in food deserts often struggle to afford a diet not composed primarily of processed food. Add to this that the state needs to make access to training grounds, physical education, and quality nutrition far better than it currently is for many citizens. This is to say nothing of improving environmental laws to protect us from having our air and water outright poisoned by corporate bad actors. 
apart from all of the above being sedentary and consuming unhealthy food and drink are as certainly as uh, are certainly as Kennedy wrote within one's rights in a free country. Now, let me finish this section. We'll pause for a minute because I have something I'd like to say about these things. Nevertheless, the state and the citizen form a circuit. One cannot improve without the help of the other. Consider the ballooning costs of health care. The state has a duty to us, no doubt, but except for the chronically ill or dying, the responsibility works both ways. If we saw a complete apathy about physical conditioning as a dereliction of duty to the collective body, might this not alter at least some of our choices? What do you think about that? Don't you have a duty to be fit? You don't necessarily have a duty to have a, you know, a six pack and be the strongest guy in the gym and be able to beat up everybody you see, but don't you have a duty to put some effort into your physical fitness? Duty to yourself, duty to your family, duty to your neighbors, duty to your loved ones, duty to your country. Okay, think about that. Um, I'm gonna pause again for one, just one second. Excuse me, I have to just say something to somebody in the other room. So uh, I'm gonna put uh, put this on hold for just one second. I'll be right back, and we'll pick up with patriotism versus nationalism. All right, well, here we go. Patriotism versus nationalism. Perhaps the collective body as a phrase and an idea offers the possibility of conceptualizing patriotism in a positive sense for those who, like Klosterman's friends, don't welcome the word. Or consider the distinction writer George Packer, echoing Orwell, drew between it and nationalism in a New Yorker interview, quoting now George Packer. Nationalism is a word I avoid as a positive. I think nationalism is destructive, it has an aggressive quality. We are not just different, but better. And in some ways, we must crush you. Patriotism to me is closer to what I'm trying to describe because it's like loyalty. Just as you are more loyal to your family than to people you don't know. I feel the same about our country. And I know that that's a tricky and maybe dangerous thing for some Americans. But the first thing I'd say is if you suppress that in yourself or if you refuse to acknowledge it in others, you will ensure that the worst versions of it will have the field because most people still feel that. And if they don't hear it from the side that wants equality and inclusiveness, then they're going to hear it from the side that wants hierarchy and exclusion. Okay, unquote. We live in a world of increasingly selfish motivation, atomized effort, let's call it, where fitness is little more than another luxury or social status device. In this scenario, training doesn't weave you into the large civic, larger civic body, but pulls you further from it. Humans are not simply animals, but it's difficult not to call to mind the notorious rodent studies for the National Institute of Mental Health by John Calhoun from 1954 to 1984. The 25th iteration of his mouse experiment, Universe 25, involved a massive set of mouse apartments and an exponentially increasing rodent population. The population peaked at 2,200 mice, resulting in aberrant behavior including asexuality and actions such as eating each other's tails. A group of what Calhoun termed the beautiful ones isolated themselves, refused to engage in breeding or socializing, and set about grooming themselves all day long. Among the so-called fitness community, one sees a lot of beautiful ones. This is weirdly mirrored by those who argue fitness doesn't or shouldn't matter, who are also divorced from the realness of community and the realness of the world, and the demands it makes of you. Both groups superficially oppose each other, but both represent the form of grooming and isolation. Maybe I'm being naive, writes the author, but I can imagine a wellspring of loyalty, what Packer calls patriotism, capable of solving America's 21st century polarization. <laughs> so I, I agree, you know, with the importance of the physical exercise, even with the link of physical exercise to patriotism. But boy, it's extremely hard, isn't it, to imagine that it's capable of solving America's 21st century polarization. You know, there are gonna be people who the fitter you get, the more you are like Hitler in their eyes. And it seems really hard to imagine a world in which they will ever snap out of that. But, you know, you have to hope for the best, I guess. Uh, I return to Socrates' dual prong with which he prods epigenes. It is a sense of calling, of duty paired with curiosity. How excellent might you become if you experimented with challenging yourself? That's Socrates' question. And it opens up a larger set of questions, questions about excellence, about merit, about standards in any field. 
that many of us have grown reluctant to grapple with. You know that because excellence is not egalitarian. While there are legitimate concerns about meritocracy in general, such as those, those voiced by philosopher Michael Sandel, I suspect that large-scale dismissal of the ethical drive towards excellence would be devastating. Excellence as an abstraction becomes suspect when we hear undertones of judgment and discrimination. Yet, what if excellence could be conceived of not as a menacing height, but as an inviting possibility? Okay, I just exaggerated, by the way, I got to get off the article for a minute when I said excellence you know, uh, is in contrast with egalitarianism. We focus on egalitarianism, therefore we denigrate excellence. That's not completely true. I mean, you have a lot of professional sports teams where, you know, you look at Luca and you look at um, the Joker in the NBA and your favorite hockey players and your favorite boxers and all of that. And clearly there's no sense of egalitarianism there. You know what it means to be excellent. Uh, I started practicing jujitsu not so long ago and if you roll once with somebody at a higher belt level and it seems like they're impossibly high on the hierarchy of excellence compared to uh, compared to you as a lower belt. So there are many cases, I think, still in life where we do understand and appreciate those who excel, but to get back to the article. In 1957, at an otherwise ordinary high school in Southern California, physical education coach and World War II veteran Stan Leprati began a physical literacy program that has become the stuff of legend. The program required all students at last year a high school to participate in a demanding five-day-a-week calisthenics regimen and used colorful shorts as a ranking system to harness their natural competitive energies. Okay, maybe akin here to belts in martial arts. White shorts were for rookies with special attention to exercise techniques given to children who significantly lagged in one or more fitness metrics. One could rise to red, then blue, then purple, and then gold by mastering progressively more difficult skills. A vanishingly small percentage of students managed to earn the ultimate rank, navy blue shorts. This required, among other things, that students be able to do 50 handstand press-ups, 52 dips, 34 pull-ups, and two consecutive trips up and down a 20-foot rope using only their hands. Wow, just thinking about that. <clears throat> the program ran from 1957 to 1983 when the high school closed. Over that time, only 21 students earned the Navy trunks. Nevertheless, pursuing a pinnacle of excellence seemed to have inspired children across the board. In an interview from that time, a young man going through the program notes, quote, at first you wonder if you're going to be able to keep up and do what's expected of you. Then, when you discover that you can, you start to get excited by the possibilities. There's always another challenge, a higher level to try to reach. I think that's what kids are looking for today. Like Turnfater Jan more than 100 years earlier, Leprati had captured the student's imagination with ideas of what they might become through focused effort. Some readers might be concerned here, the author continues, about the potential for deleterious effects on the morale of students who struggled to distinguish themselves in such an intense program. That's how I feel as a white belt. Yesterday I rolled with a black belt instructor and it definitely had a deleterious effect on my morale. For his physical education doctoral dissertation in 1975, entitled Self-Concept and Physical Achievement, physical education coach Richard Chester Tucker studied schools like La Sierra. He found that Far from the bullying or ridicule some might assume would naturally follow from a ranking system based on different colored shorts, Tucker found the opposite. The kids worked as a team to improve, encouraging each other to rise up the ranks. This was a non-zero-sum competition against one's own limitations, group morale versus any individual failure. The Greeks placed a lot of emphasis on the concept of arete or excellence. It was the whole raison d'etre of the original Olympic Games to see what the gods could inspire mere mortals to achieve. But while it's easy to grasp what excellence means in the limited context of a javelin throwing contest, it's harder to grasp what is excellent or dutiful about athleticism in a world where modern warfare is conducted in places like Ukraine with American supplied javelin missiles. Okay, that's true, so pause here. You know, if you used to do physical exercise because you had to do hand-to-hand -hand combat, but now all you have to do, let's say in some cases, right, is sit at a remotely controlled device is it still necessary that you can wear the navy blue trunks of uh, those students who were able to do you know, a million push-ups and uh, climb a rope uh, and so on? So that's a question. Here too, the concept of duty helps to illuminate the ethical position of any person capable of improving themselves, whether they are required to or not. One man who, like Jan, had an outsized impact on the physical culture of his contemporaries was Georges Hibert, Herbert, Herbert, 
uh, Ibert. During his time as a French naval officer, there was a volcanic eruption near the town of Saint-Pierre in Martinique. Aiding in the rescue operation, Ibert was deeply impressed by the experience. In particular, he observed how keenly humans needed both physical preparedness and radical altruism in the face of such situations. His motto became, be strong to be useful. Again, like Jan Ibert focused on youth education and designed a carefully monitored set of progressions to promote what he called natural movement. The protocol prefigures the one Leprati established in La Sierra with climbing, jumping, throwing, swimming, and some martial arts. There was also a focus on altruism and the spirit of collective effort. Let me just pause for a minute. It seems like this is the kind of thing that goes as a pendulum, you know? People get soft, their educators encourage them to go back to athletic excellence. Uh, you set up some programs for athletic excellence, then it gets undermined. How does it get undermined? This article hasn't really gone into the details, but maybe it gets undermined by the um, collective efforts of the people who didn't advance very far, who lost interest in advancing, and then who say, you know what, you're just uh, jocks and eggheads and uh, not, not eggheads. You're just, you know, you're just meatheads. And uh, instead of having big muscles and no brain, you know, they introduce this artificial split between gymnastic excellence and intellectual excellence, and then declare war on the, uh, on the jocks, which is what it was like when I was uh, growing up to some extent, you know, you had the people who quote unquote read books, those who lifted weights, that was hugely detrimental to my understanding of the relationship between mind and body. I highly regret ever falling into uh, that dichotomy, and I much prefer this model of classical republicanism that combines, in the Socratic way, physical training and intellectual development. Let's go back to the article. Ibert favored exciting challenges that tested every level of athletic ability and developed obstacle courses that influenced 21st century parkour. His designs helped inspire the modern adventure playground with their heights and other managed risks and the presence of play workers who, like park rangers, maintain and facilitate the play space but don't intrude on the children's work of self-challenge and discovery. Core to Iber's ethos was the democratization of physical activity, the conviction that it should belong, not to an elite few, but to all. He made a high-profile break with Baron de Coubertin, founder of the modern Olympics, when he rejected the concept of the games and the professionalization of sport in general. The world was becoming a spectator-oriented reality, he believed, instead of a participant-oriented one. Wasn't there just uh, approved, um, what do you call it? What's it called when you take drugs to make yourself uh, a better athlete? Not doping, but enhanced, enhanced Olympics. I think I read that Peter Thiel was one of the financiers of a new, um, a new undertaking of the enhanced Olympics where you're allowed to dope. Obviously that's also gonna be spectator oriented because it's gonna be only a very few who can compete there, I assume. His 1925 book, Sport versus Physical Education, argued that money, merchandising, and spectacle would foster arrogance among athletes, promote passivity in non-athletes, right, the couch potatoes who just watch, and corrupt the spirit of self-challenge, altruism, and civic mindedness. It's hard to dispute Iber's prescience. I don't claim some idol of ubiquitous athleticism existed in Iber's time or any other, but I do put stock in his vision, that aspirational concept of robustness twinned with selflessness that impressed itself on him in a reeling town in Martinique. Uh, I see a comment about this long article. It's true, it's a little bit on the long side. I'm enjoying it, hope you are too. And uh, I think we're marching steadily towards the conclusion. The world has seen something of that awesome power of unity demonstrated in Ukraine. Perhaps it may seem grotesque or glib to compare that horrific and bloody conflict to an issue as diffuse as sedentary living. Yet in the United States, a recent shocking study found that more than half the population worries another civil war will erupt in the next decade. From the study, quote, among 6,768 respondents who considered violence to be at least sometimes justified to achieve specific political objectives, 12.2% were willing to commit political violence themselves to threaten or intimidate a person, 10.4% to injure a person, and 7.1% to kill a person, unquote. We are as much in need of social cohesion as we are in need of better physical health. It's hard to argue with that, isn't it? What if, per Iber's dream, the two fed each other? The United States is further from that dream than many nations, despite exorbitant spending on expensive collegiate sports facilities, top-level coaching for elite athletes and Olympic medal halls. The Centers for, the centers for Disease Control and Prevention found that only 24% of the general U.S. population meets the basic standards for combined aerobic and strength conditioning. It ranks 20th 
and engagement with physical exercise far behind global leaders like Australia, Taiwan, Norway, and New Zealand. Come on, those Americans listening to this, pick it up. Pick up a martial art, go to the gym, uh, rank higher than 20th. Don't be one of the, however many, 76% who don't meet the basic standards for combined aerobic and strength conditioning. One theory for why these particular countries are so much more successful is their cultures that place an emphasis on time spent outdoors. They are cultures that place an emphasis on time spent outdoors, especially true in Australia, New Zealand, and Scandinavia. Studies suggest that people who exercise outdoors tend to do so for longer, and this matches with Jan's preference for free outdoor calisthenics. One analyst posited that the Taiwan government's focus on subsidizing low-cost public gyms while cracking down on private gyms with predatory contracts helped lead to the nation's 406% boom in gym growth between 2013 and 2020. According to a report from the University of Nottingham's Taiwan Research Hub, these and other government policies improved exercise rates by 33%, making the island nation's efforts a compelling civic model of fitness outreach. Meanwhile, despite the cultural differences between NATO countries like Finland, Denmark, Estonia, Greece, and Austria, they each have a potential template for weaving physical fitness into the civic body along the lines of mandatory national service, whereby young citizens spend a year or more in either military or civilian service. Incidentally, something else you can see discussed in Plato's Laws as an institution in Sparta and Crete, I think, Sparta for sure. To take the Austrian model as an example, about 40% of civilian service members work as EMTs, about 25% in social care, and then it breaks down into smaller niches, working with refugees, disaster relief, agricultural assistance, and so on. What if, the author asks, every Western country instituted a national service and a substantial subset of those serving helped administer physical education and or physical games in free public exercise parks? Let's call it play work. What do you think? Is this a realistic proposal? Alternatively, nonprofit volunteer groups could spearhead the initiative. There's no particular reason why this has to be an exclusively public or private enterprise. The concept of food deserts has caught on, but what about being movement starved? Can we collectively learn to move again and in more compelling ways? National service in the form of coordinating play or physical recreation could also give direction to a lot of young men who divorced from a sense of purpose are dropping out of college, the job market and society at large, you know? This is true. If you ever engaged in a sport or exercise or training of some kind, a martial art, uh, didn't it give you a sense of direction? Didn't it give you a sense of purpose? Suddenly, whatever else is going on in your life, you know, hey, I want to make sure I don't miss the class. I have things that I'm working on. I have people I'm training against. I have a direction to go and uh, somewhere to grow. So that gives you a sense of purpose and, and direction and meaning, doesn't it? The routes by which we might approach building a better relationship between individuals and their physical bodies are almost limitless, and the potential obstacles are equally dizzying. Long before we arrive at questions of what form the transformation would take and how it could be funded, we must acknowledge the near impossibility of forming a consensus on anything in the 21st century. We are awash in contradictory information on virtually every subject. Our political tribes seem almost to perceive different realities. Suggesting we undo this Gordian knot by exercising together is bound to strike many readers as naive and impossible to implement. My purpose here is simply to recount certain specific limited scenarios in which the vision of a broadly positive, civic-minded physical culture has been achieved, and to pose the question, what fundamental perceptual shifts would be required to realize the same in any given community? I come back to the particular qualities of gymnastics, its emphasis on individual excellence and in clean form, dovetailing with the collectivist team spirit, and to the idealism of Turn Fater Jan. Around the same time that the Brothers Grimm were collecting folklore, Jan the philologist coined the term folkstum, literally folkdom, which conveyed a sense of community. His aim was to unify a fairly ethnically homogenous people fragmented by a lack of shared nationhood. The problem facing our own time is the reverse. Ethnically and ideologically diverse people yoked together tenuously by an abstract notion of citizenhood. Even a single city block can house people with radically different cultural backgrounds and tastes in everything, including athletic modalities. That's true, isn't it? Still, I suspect that the 21st century folkstum could evolve, divested of the uglier elements of xenophobia and nationalistic tribalism that characterize the fascistic movements of the 20th century. It would be the physical language of small communities, people who live near each other, who run 
or swim together who spot each other in calisthenic workouts. Ultimately, these neighbors will depend on each other if some physical threat befalls their community. It would be an antidote to the atomization of modern life, where we seal ourselves off into algorithmically tailored, non-physical pockets of comfort. Patriotism, as we read now the last paragraph of this long but good and interesting piece of writing, patriotism is paradoxical. It can be used for violent revolt or its opposite. Profound societal cohesion across all geographic regions and class layers. More than 175 years after the gymnastics revolutionaries demanded a change to the semi-feudal ruling class in Prussia, we in the West are in need of another revolution. Again, not just in how we relate to our bodies, but also in how we perceive our social reality. If we and our neighbors are ultimately one social and civic body, surely it's one of our primary duties and a deep calling to see what this great body is capable of when we challenge it properly. Okay, a nice invocation there of Socrates at the end, except taking the idea of challenging your body um, as a person and putting it onto the civic body again uh, to see what the great body politic is capable of when we challenge it proper, properly. Wow, okay, so that was pretty good. I hope you enjoyed that. Let's remind ourselves what we were reading together here. By challenging our physical bodies, we may heal our civic ones. Written by Colm O'Shea, March 7th, 2024, and published, if you can see here, at Noema, and the link, noemamag.com. We always try to give credit where it's due. We read great articles on this channel that give us something to think about, and you should support the, uh, the magazines and the authors as best as you can. Okay, my name is a reminder, Michael Millerman. I teach at millermanschool.com. If you're interested, I have courses on Plato, Aristotle, classical republicanism, Rousseau, Nietzsche, okay, many authors who are also interested in these questions, the questions of exercise and morality and civic duty and all of that. And as I said earlier, you know, there are some people who might wonder, in an age of transition, as I show this book, The Sovereign Individual, Mastering the Transition to the Information Age, in an age of transition, if we are in one, to an information age, maybe we're undergoing a deterritorialization where you're not going to have patriotism. What you're going to have is a lot of people who got rich on Bitcoin or something else. They exit their systems. They go buy some land somewhere and there they set up their own new communities where everybody does jujitsu, but they don't do it for the sake of defending their existing fatherlands. Uh, in their existing countries because of all of the divisions and all of the obstacles that you can imagine, some of which were discussed in this paper. Okay, so what I had planned for us today was two articles. Now I see we're an hour in. A lot of people here, good to be with you. Thank you for spending your time here. I hope you're enjoying this. Let's see, do we have, do we have the energy to go over meta person? Another article, this one is from The Nation, March 6th, The Enchanted Worlds of Marshall Salins, written by Anna Della Subin. I'd never heard of this person, person, Marshall Salins, but the topic has come up in my private tutoring very often about the disenchanted world versus enchanted world, the loss of meaning, loss of purpose, loss of direction, the relationship between the kind of scientific uh, urge to speak with scientific knowledge about everything that can be said versus all of the pockets of human existence that escape scientific formulation, you know, the gods, the divine power, the realm of the holy, the world of meaning and significance that eludes many of us today. In some sense, this other article said, look, if you want to have meaning and purpose in your life, start with movement. And this article says, if you want to have meaning and purpose in your life, let's look at the realm of the gods and the divine power and our relation to myth and story and all of that. So let's do it. Let's go over it, okay? That was the plan and I'd like to carry it through. Let me just catch my breath, drink my coffee. I'm gonna put the chat here up on screen and uh, I appreciate everybody being here. As I said, make yourselves known if you want, your opinions, your thoughts. If something seems outrageous, if you have a memory you wanna share, okay, about your gym class and whether you also had to scale the wall and get you know, some gold, uh, <clears throat> gold shorts as a sign of your development. Uh, I'll tell you something from my case. Uh, I'm just putting some, putting some of these comments on screen so you can see it if you didn't see it earlier. Okay. Much different conversations going on in the chat here, which is good. Um, look, I already mentioned as I was reading that article that when I was a young guy, 
younger than I am now, I remember very distinctly something that I hugely regret, which is that, you know, in the gym class, I wasn't the strongest guy. I was pretty, you know, a bit of a nerdy weakling at that time, to tell you the truth. And when I couldn't, you know, everybody was lining up to do a bench press. I didn't do it very well or something like that. And I kind of laughed. This was in grade four. I remember because the teacher was somebody who's kind of like the people we just read about. He was encouraging people to do physical exercise. And uh, so I couldn't do the bench press at the time. And I sort of laughed it off. I did some jokey clownish comment. And uh, I remember very clearly this teacher, grade four teacher said something along the lines of, you know, you're just being a clown about it because you're too weak to do it. Something like that, you know. And I think that does happen at times. People people who fail the test of physical strength, they have a kind of, uh, they look down on physical exercise. They find some other way. Who knows, maybe Larry David, a great Jewish comedian, if you know who he is, uh, a Curb Your Enthusiasm, Seinfeld, and all the rest of it. You know, you wouldn't consider him a particularly strong or buff guy. As you look at him, he's hilarious. Maybe once upon a time he tried to bench press, he failed, and he became a funny guy, a funny man. But actually, I think, as I mentioned earlier, and as the article mentioned, the combination of movement, exercise, fitness, and it doesn't have to be so crazy and so extreme that you never again have the soft sensitivity of a poet or an author or somebody who can enjoy a piece of music. You know, this is straightforwardly present in Plato's dialogues, where it's basically said that there are two extremes you can succumb to. You can get an interest in the refined things and the softer things in life, but they make you too soft. Or you can get an interest in physical fitness, strength, and uh, shows of, uh, you know, um, great physical feats, but then you become too hard and you have to remain pliable, you know, so you shouldn't be all brawn or all brain. You have to find that sweet Socratic moderation. Anyway, let's do this article, The Nation, uh, Meta Person, and now we're talking about enchantment, disenchantment, okay? The gods and their relationship to a world in which, what, have they fled? Are they returning? Let's see. Is a god or any divine power only a mirage of the human-made political structures that oppress us? This understanding of religion, popularized by 19th century thinkers like Karl Marx and Emile Durkheim, has become received wisdom among the anthropologists and sociologists studying the origins and functions of religious life. We sense that we live under forces of authority that constrain us, and yet we cannot precisely locate or understand them. Needing to give some shape or form to this coercion, sorry, I'm just going to like that. Needing to give some shape or form to this coercion, we project it onto the clouds, fashioning heavenly beings that are ultimately deifications of the human state. Religion is realistic, Durkheim noted. It corresponds to our social realities and reinforces them. Yet, the existence of societies without chiefs or kings or any vertical political organization challenges this picture. In communities that traditionally recognized no rulers or government, from Tierra del Fuego to the Central Arctic to the Philippines, we still find complex concepts of celestial hierarchies, meta-human authorities, and bureaucracies of deities and spirits with no correspondence to the human social order. Okay, you get the point. So if you thought gods were just a reflection of kings, what about the presence of gods in those places where there are no kings? Where do these ideas come from, which reflect no living conditions on the ground? How is it that notions of the state seem to be anticipated by cosmology before they are realized in society? These questions lie at the heart of Marshall Salen's final book. And by the way, I'd never seen his name before, never heard his name before, so if I'm mispronouncing it, my apologies. These books lie at the heart of Marshall Salen's final book, The New Science of the Enchanted Universe, an Anthropology of Most of Humanity. Across most cultures, Salen observes, human life unfolds in continuous reference to other beings, supreme gods and minor deities, ancestral spirits, demons, indwelling souls and animals and plants who act as the intimate everyday agents of human success or ruin, whether in agriculture, hunting, procreation, or politics. These not quite humans or meta persons can be found across all landscapes from the Chuang leaf people in the Malay Peninsula to the Greenland Inuits who had the idea that spirits animate each human joint and knuckle. 
Indigenous communities possess empirical knowledge about these spirit worlds, yet anthropologists often use the language of quote-unquote belief or worse quote-unquote folk belief, folk belief to describe them, an approach loaded with their own disbelief. Rejecting the obscurant category of belief, Salins asks, what if we saw metapersons as worthy of a science of their own? If we examine them as a ubiquitous global presence and attempt to tease out general theories about their role in human political and economic life, what would this new science teach us? Okay, those of you who follow me, if any of you uh, who do are here for my work on Alexander Dugan, you know you have that kind of uh, thinking about angels in the fourth political theory, for example, okay? That each people has its angel, that you can think about a political order called Angelopolis. Okay, that's meta person, right? Angel is a kind of meta person here. Published posthumously, the new science of the enchanted universe is riveting. And this is in part because Salins writes with an incant incantatory, late style openness to the existence of metapersons, just as he began to turn into an ancestral spirit himself. In the late autumn of 2020, Salins had become paralyzed after a fall. Not long before his 90th birthday, he slipped into a dissociative state and was given days to live. Yet he soon serviced from the hereafter, determined to finish the manuscript. Having lost the use of both hands, over the next few months, he dictated it to his son, the historian Peter Salins, and completed it a month before his death. The book, My Swan Song, as he calls it in the preface, is electrified by ideas of human finitude and eternity, the lacing of the political, the enchanted, and the divine, that Salins, even near his end, could not lay to rest. I don't know about you, but I will be ordering a copy of that book. If Marshall Salins had a faith of his own, it was humor. Born in 1930 in Chicago, the son of Russian Jewish immigrants, Salins was raised in a secular household, although his family counted among its ancestors the 18th century Jewish mystic Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidic Judaism, who was famous for his laughter during a Passover Seder. This contagious charismatic wit was something of a family inheritance. His brother Bernard Salins later became a comedian, while Marshall became known for a mix of mischief and polemic that ignited conversations as well as the written page. He studied anthropology at the University of Michigan, sailed through a PhD at Columbia in two years, and then returned to Michigan to teach. In those years, Salins was an evolutionary materialist, interested in how cultures evolve alongside technological progress. His dissertation, Social Stratification in Polynesia, took this approach, looking at how cultural difference arises through environmental and economic factors. Yet, by the mid-1960s, the United States' disastrous war in Vietnam had shattered the technological determinism that Salins was taught in school and revealed to him how ways of understanding cultural progress are often at the behest of empire. As Salins recalled in an interview, he became interested in what he called the indigenization of modernity, the ways in which peoples attempt to engage the encroaching world system in something even more encompassing, their own system of the world. He had observed this phenomenon during fieldwork on the island of Moala in Fiji in 1955, where he studied how chiefly lineages adapted to new orders of power. Okay, so I think very roughly this is like, on one hand, you have the end of history, the victory of liberal democratic capitalism at the end of the Cold War, but then you have the interpretation of that not as the victory of the liberal system, but you know as the ultimate defeat of the Antichrist or the onset of the Kali Yuga, you know, in taking the Western modernity and incorporating it into something more encompassing, a non-Western, non-modern system of the world. That's how I read that. Let's see. The 1960s were a transformative period for Salins, intensifying his left-leaning commitments. Gonna get a, um, sorry for all the flashing on screen. What can I tell you? The 1960s were a transformative period for Salins, intensifying his left-leaning commitments and sharpening his political activism. Amid the upheavals in the United States and Vietnam, Salins detected a clear and simple law of revolution, that it is the rulers, not the revolutionaries, who undermine a society's culture and principles of government. It is from deep traditional values that the opposition draws its outrage and in defense of them takes to the streets. He later reflected in a collection of political essays called Culture in Practice. At an all-night protest in Ann Arbor in 1965, Salins led the first anti-Vietnam War teach-in and is often credited as the inventor of the concept, which took college campuses by storm. Soon after, he organized the national teach-in of thousands of students in Washington, D.C., and the following year, he flew to Vietnam, where he taped a set of darkly absurd dialogues with American operatives, hard-headed surrealists, as he called them. 
In 1968, Salins moved to Paris to participate in the famed anthropological lab, uh, laboratoire of Claude Lévi-Strauss, and he also witnessed the mass student protests and workers' strikes that year. Inspired by the collective uprising, he sought to adapt Lévi-Strauss's theory of structuralism, of how symbols, patterns, and binaries form the building blocks and hidden laws that structure human thought. What happens when these structures collide with a revolutionary present? How do individuals become agents of historical change? And by the way, as I've shown you a few times, a book I'm reading right now, The Sovereign Individual, Mastering the Transition to the Information Age, similar sorts of questions, wherever you have a structural analysis, like uh, you know, you have industrial, you have medieval period and industrial age, information age, you have structures, where does agency fit into that? Um, how do individuals become agents of historical change when structures collide with the revolutionary present? Amid the labor strikes, Salins was also contemplating how leisurely life must have been in the Paleolithic period. In his essay, The Original Affluent Society, he argued that hunter-gatherers lived not in hard scrabble misery on the edge of starvation, but in prosperity. There is, Salins wrote, a Zen road to affluence, departing from premises somewhat different from our own. That human material wants are finite and few. Among pre-agricultural tribes, Salins calculated food acquisition took only three to five hours per day, leaving plenty of time for feasting, recreation, and sleep. In contrast, the market industrial system institutes scarcity in a manner completely unparalleled, as it requires insufficiency as the foundation of all economic activity. Poverty, Salins wrote, is above all a relation between people. Poverty is a social status. As such, it is the invention of civilization, which forges tributary relationships between classes. Salins developed these ideas in Stone Age Economics, 1972, a book that half a century later remains a prophetic call for degrowth amid the current climate collapse. For Salins, so we're getting a background here on his literary history as we move towards his final book in which he takes seriously meta-persons or these um, angels and other divine sorts of beings, I guess. For Salins, indigenous cultures offered profound counterpoints to how humans might live, a theme he continued to develop after his move in 1973 to the University of Chicago, where he remained for nearly 50 years. So uh, Leo Strauss would not have been there, right? 1970s. <clears throat> in Islands of History, he began to investigate how divinity intersects with cultural structures and historic events. Okay, how divinity intersects with cultural structures and historic events, most notoriously through the fate of James Cook. In 1779, when Captain Cook landed on Hawaii, he was reportedly hailed as the god, Lono, and a rapturous crowd of thousands offered him sacrifices. Yet when Cook stepped ashore a second time, after his ship was damaged in a storm, he was slain. Salins argued that this was because Cook was inadvertently playing out the script of a myth held by the islanders, that when the god returns, he must act out a battle with the king. To the anthropologist Gananath Abeyeskier, Salins' analysis was exoticizing and patronizing, for it denied Hawaiians common sense. Why would Polynesians mistake a Yorkshireman for their own god? For Obiascari, what he called practical rationality was universal, while Salins argued for its cultural specificity in his 1995 book-length reply, How Natives Think About Captain Cook, for example. On Hawaii, Salins wrote, politics appears as the continuation of cosmogenic war, excuse me, cosmogonic war by other means. Okay, I want to read you something really quickly. Let me just pull it up. It's on this point. Uh, one minute. Um... So, you know, okay, this general idea, right? This general idea that, to repeat, you know, politics is the continuation of um, war of the gods in some sense, okay? Politics is a continuation of the war of the gods. That it's not that you start with politics and then you get religion as a reflection of the uh, differences between rulers and ruled or you know, kings and peasants, you know, that you start with the political king and then you derive the figure of a kingdom of heaven and of the ruler of the earth. But rather, you know, this seems like in this presentation, the divine beliefs come first. So we should have everything on the table, right? That the politics comes first and then is followed by the theology, that the theology comes first and is followed by the politics, and that the two are somehow mutually implicating that you can't really tell which comes first. They are simultaneously present. So there's a, you know, an author that I work on. Okay, you see here on screen. Um, and I want to read you one of the most memorable 
passages from his book is right here. It says, the title No Omachia, which literally means wars of the mind, or wars of nous, intellect, nous, and which can also be conceived of as war within the mind, war of minds, or even war against the mind, okay, mind meaning nous here every time, is intended to emphasize the conflictual nature of logoi structures. So these are sort of like cultural patterns of interpretation, so to speak, as well as the multiplicity of noetic fields, the sciences and so on, in each of which surprises, conflicts, aporias, struggles, contradictions, and opposition lie in wait for us. And now we're going to get to the specific thing. I'm going to go down here. Wars between people, including even the most cruel and bloody, are but pale comparisons to the wars of the gods, titans, giants, elements, demons, and angels. And these in turn are but figures illustrating even more formidable and profound wars unfolding in Nus, in the sphere of Nus and its limits in which the mind itself borders the zone of madness, thus everything is no omachia. Okay, why do I read you this? Because there are some thinkers for whom it's obvious that the realm of politics intersects with the realm of the divine in very important ways. In this case, you go from the war of politics to the gods, and then from the gods to nous, okay, and to the three logoi, Dionysian, Apollonian, and Sibelian. Okay, and there are other thinkers who do it in other ways, like, for example, Carl Schmitt, who talks about political theology. So you should be aware that this is a, a theme, okay? There are some thinkers for whom politics is saturated by the presence of the divine, and we're putting Salen in that category, I guess, as we read about his life's work and about his thoughts. So to go back to the article, these ideas deepened through Salen's ongoing dialogue with a luminous former student, the author and activist David Graeber, who died less than a year before his teacher. In 2017, Salens and Graeber published The Monumental on Kings, in which they argued that the structures of sacred kingship have never vanished from modern politics or our institutions of quote-unquote popular sovereignty. Throughout on Kings, superhuman beings continuously appear, even setting the terms and conditions of human existence. One even appears on its cover, the frontispiece of Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, depicting the crowned monarch rising above the human landscape, his body made of myriad tiny persons who blur together like a scaly coat of armor. The image reveals how metapersons have penetrated the conceptualization of the state in Western traditions, often deemed the apex of rational, secular thought. The essence of political power, Salins and Graver wrote, is the ability to act as if one were a god, to step outside the confines of the human and return to reign favor or destruction. It must have been while he was writing on Kings that the metapersons approached Salins and requested or demanded that he devote an entire book to them. Okay, so he was basically visited by the gods, visited by his angels, visited by the muses. And uh, he has then his new book, The New Science of the Enchanted Universe, takes as its starting point perhaps the earliest cultural revolution, that of the Axial Age, the period between the 8th and 3rd centuries BCE, in which the civilizations of Greece, the Near East, India, and China underwent a seismic shift. Notions of divinity, Salins tells us, moved from an imminent presence in human activity to a transcendental other world of its own reality, creating the foundations for the Vedic, Buddhist, Judaic, and later Christian and Islamic religions. In the disenchanting exodus of transcendence, the high gods and spirits evacuated to the upper echelons of the sky, leaving the earth alone to humans, now free to create their own institutions by their own means and lights. Okay, so the transcendence of the gods serves as a sort of flight of the gods from human affairs. In societies that remained enchanted, the legions of metapersons continued to be the decisive agents of human weal and woe, and what we would call culture was still not considered a human thing. In contrast, in the transcendental societies, culture became humankind's own invention, a domain entirely under our control. Boy, there's so much to say just about this paragraph right here. We could spend hours, I think, discussing the difference between the imminent presence of the gods in human activity versus their flight to a transcendent other world. Boy, I got to fight the temptation, though. Otherwise, we'll never be through with this article. So uh, make a note of it if you want, and maybe we can return to it later. In what Salins calls the second axial age, rooted in the doctrinal wars and imperialist conquests of the early modern period from the 15th through the 19th centuries, European civilization forged a set of abstract, differentiated spheres, religion, politics, economics, culture, science, and nature, 
that created further distance from the once enchanted cosmos. The realm of the economy came to be seen as the base of the pyramid of quotidian life, while divinity moved from being the infrastructure to the superstructure. With each axial turn came a host of intractable theological dilemmas. Throughout the book, the immanentist perspective emerges as the most intuitive, as it escapes the perennial problem of theodicy, of why an infinitely benevolent almighty would cause so much harm to mortals or even get involved in their minutia that plagues transcendentalism. In the new science, Salen's attempts to convene a vivid conference of meta-persons and let them speak without imposing the distorting transcendentalist categories upon them. Okay, so once again, guys, meta-persons here are like the divine beings and he wants to get away from the transcendentalist interpretation of these meta-persons or divine beings. And so in his new book, his last book, he does that. He attempts to convene a vivid conference of metapersons and let them speak without imposing the distorting transcendentalist categories upon them. These familiar binaries of natural versus supernatural, material versus spiritual, secular versus religious, make no sense, he argues, as a way to understand the halibut master of species that brokers deals with quackutal fishermen in the Pacific Northwest. For ancient Sumerians, Minerals like salt were alive with opinions of their own. Bakongo people had a practice of shaving the head to keep it clear and smooth for spirits that might want to land there, as the anthropologist Wyatt McAfee reported. It is not surprising, given the huge range of ways to suffer, that demons tend to be the most diverse and heavily populated class of metahumans. The Chuang recognized 27 different types. All that exists lives a Siberian Chuchki shaman told the Russian ethnographer Waldemar Bogoras, the lamp walks around. The walls of the house have voices of their own. Even the shadows on the wall constitute definite tribes and have their own country where they live in huts and subsist by hunting. Okay, so you see here, right? Everything is invested with significance. Everything is invested with a divine presence. Everything up to and including the lamp, the walls, and the shadows. The Chuchki descended from nomadic hunter-gatherers are among what Salins calls the so-called tribes without rulers who historically lacked vertical political structures, yet knew entrenched cosmic forms of authority. In the early 20th century, the shaman described to Bogoris how they were subjugated to hosts of invisible mercenary spirits with whom they had to forge alliances or pay ransoms for protection. One might theorize that cosmic polities are modeled, if not around earthly political coercion, than after patriarchy within the unit of the human family itself. Yet even in communities that prize familiar relations of equality, Salen's notes, such as the Buid of Mindoro in the Philippines, we find strongly hierarchical concepts of the metahuman world that in no way reflect their equitable model of life. Salen's particularly focuses on geographically isolated groups uninfluenced by transcendentalist missionaries, such as the subarctic Naskapi in what is now Northern Canada, who acquiesced to no authority except the overlord Moosefly. Flanked by his avatars, the stinging Moosefly that appears during the summer salmon fishing season, the Moosefly rules over the fish tribes upon whom Naskapi life depends. Humans must obey his laws, such as never making fun of a fish for its big eyes. <clears throat> I mean, I can ask you as we go through this, you know, if you are somebody who laments the disenchantment of the world and you think everything's become overly mathematized and technologized and computerized and algorithmatized and all of that, um, what does the reenchantment of the world look like for you? Does it look like that lamps and shadows and walls have gods and that you should never make fun of a fish for its big eyes because you don't want to offend Moosefly, who rules over the fish tribes? Or what? How far are you willing to go in the name of reenchantment? And where are you not willing to go? What's the right way to think about it? Is this account of meta persons and their role in our societies adequate? Continuing, the state of nature had the nature of the state, as Salins put it in a companion essay in the volume Sacred Kingship in World History. If imminence was the original human condition out of which transcendentalist civilizations arose, it follows that a hierarchical cosmology was already in place from the beginning almost as if originating from a source that pre-existed human life. This possibility is furthered by the existence of utterly random, bizarre laws that seem to serve no human function. The United States has many. Uh, before I go to that, I just want to tell you, I mean, I can't help it, but in this book right here, a masterpiece, 
In my opinion, I teach it in private tutoring. I have a course on it in my school, Martin Heidegger's Contributions to Philosophy of the Event. Heidegger talks about the fact that you could say the world has become, the modern world has become disenchanted, overly technologized, computational, and all the rest of it. But his solution is not to return to a world where the shadows, uh, not only the shadows are gods and the walls are gods and all of that, but a world in which we have an essential transformation in the understanding of the human being, as he puts it in the first few pages, from rational animal to Dasein. Dasein being the word he uses for our openness to being, in some sense, being as such, okay? It's complicated, but you get a hang of it eventually. And Heidegger says that if we shift to an understanding of the human being as Dasein, there is no longer a basis for which there can be transcendence. Kind of a weird question. I just want to put it for those of you who are philosophically inclined or interested in this kind of thing. What do we talk about when we talk about transcendence as even a notion? Okay, let me just read this to you. Oh, whatever. This is how we do things on this channel. Okay, we're reading an article. The article talks about transcendence. And you should know that Heidegger tells us something about the possibility of transcendence. Please bear with me for one moment here. Yeah, this is going to be not comprehensible to everybody, but that's okay. So he says... Heidegger now in Contributions to Philosophy of the Event. Transcendence is understood in various senses which are interconnected. Okay, so all of these senses he's about to mention of transcendence, they belong to a certain way of thinking about the human being that Heidegger wants to overcome. And once you've overcome that old way of thinking about the human being, it doesn't make sense to talk about transcendence anymore. So he says, uh, there's transcendence in the sense of one being surpassing all others, okay, like the supreme being. One being surpassing all others, or for Christianity, the generator that surpasses generated beings, the creator and the created, okay, the creator as the transcendent, God himself, the being that is above and beyond all other beings, the encompassing and thus the universal. The being which, yeah, so in other words, one sense of transcendence is the transcendence of the supreme being. Okay, keep in mind, for Heidegger, you can't think about the supreme being without first thinking about what it means to be, which is why for Heidegger, uh, what he does, fundamental ontology or inceptual thinking is the more fundamental first step. You can't just invoke the language of being, whether it's supreme being or whatever, superior being, without thinking through what you mean by being. So that's one. Then there's um, other forms of transcendence, all of which he mentions, and he says at the end that... Dasein, when you begin to think of the human being as Dasein, all representation of quote unquote transcendence in every sense disappears. Okay, again, that's gonna, I can't go through the whole argument with you. It's very, uh, it's uh, nuanced, but I want you to know about it. Okay, so Martin Heidegger, Contributions to Philosophy of the Event, Passages on Transcendence in the chapter called Interplay, which I'm teaching in private tutoring, which is why it's on my mind. But let's go back here. Okay, in other words, let me just restate the, the issue here. We're reading about an author, Salens, who has a book about metapersons and their role in human society. But even as we're interested in that from the point of view of the end of secularization, the re-enchantment of the world, against the backdrop of that sort of anthropological, um, theologized reading of society, you have a more basic realm potentially of the philosophical questions that Heidegger asks, what does it even mean to be? What does it mean for something to be in something? You know, are the are the shadows on the wall that Salem's talked about, are they gods in the sense that there's a divine spirit in them? So what is the being of a spirit such that it can be in a shadow? You know, it's very, very strange sorts of things that you can begin to think about and that in my view are worth thinking about as you uh, turn to the question of uh, sacralization, resacralization, and all of that. So there's, as I mentioned, there are a million things I'd like to say about all of this, but we got to get through the article. So let's get back to the paper. The new science, in the new science, Salins compares, uh, where did we stop here? Sorry. Uh, we stopped. Yeah, we stopped here. In the new science, Salins compares the Inuit rules of life recorded in Bath and Land in the 1920s. If a woman sees a whale, she must point to it with her middle finger to an ancient Akkadian list of commandments, including that one must never point at a lamp. Even where there's no clear moral content, 
What is at stake is obedience to the higher metapersonal powers in a deference even better served by irrationality, a pattern replicated in the whims of autocrats today. If power descends from heaven to earth, Salen's writes, human political power is necessarily and quintessentially hubris, the appropriation of divinity in one form or another. The charisma of politicians is always given by the gods, such as the manna handed down to legions of Melanesian chiefs. In his essay, Salens touches upon the interesting point that hubris, or overstepping the boundaries between the human and the divine, also underlies structures of class, with elites often seen as possessing or appropriating spirit power. In turn, any emancipatory movement must mobilize the metahuman as the necessary precedent of political action. Salens has an eye for profound poetic details and writes with a deep empathy, as someone who is constantly moved by the ideas and worldviews he encounters. Yet, his project is tricky as he still can't help but fall back on the transcendental language of culture, politics, and science that he's familiar with to communicate what he wants to say. There's always also the anthropological danger of heroizing such traditions in a way that reduces their complexities. At times, the new science risks falling into the same trap as the debate with the Obiescari did of the attempt to unearth what people really think or worse believe for one will never truly know. One might ask not only why ideas of the metapersons are so lasting and compelling, but also why the anthropological impulse to take them on their own terms, even if this is possible, endures. It remains a powerful mode of political self-critique and a kind of self-help much needed, of which Salens is a master, although it ultimately speaks more to the West than any place else, confronting it with other ways to live and face death. In roving, uh, in between, excuse me, roving from the Amazon to New Guinea, Salens might have opened the door of his study to the many contemporary American, American metapersons from extraterrestrials and angels to imaginary friends in childhood. Even in any allegedly disenchanted culture, the vestiges of the imminent never disappear. We continue to live in a world crowded with non-human persons, from commercial brands who speak in distinct voices on Twitter, to currencies with their own agency, to the meat shunned by vegans, as Salens observes on the premise of the personhood of food. Okay, that's I wasn't really thinking about that. That's interesting. Commercial brands who speak in distinct voices as kinds of metapersons. So you see, it's not just angels and demons and gods and the devil. It's also brands and currencies and uh, even meat in this world that seems to have a voice of its own. Along with demons, ancestral spirits, including the recent familial dead, are an especially populous global demographic. Salens writes beautifully of traditions in which the dead are kept close at hand. In Quayo settlements in the Solomon Islands, he relates, people spoke as frequently to their dead relatives as to their living ones. During a festival period in the Trobriand Islands off New Guinea, when the Baloma or ancestral souls are said to return, the deceased are so closely present that the living must be careful not to spill hot drinks or wave sticks in the air, lest they injure the spirits. Okay, there's a funny uh, Woody Allen movie where he has... Um, he has a mother, you know, a nagging mother. The nagging mother dies, but then she reappears, and starts nagging him as a face in the sky. <clears throat> That's obviously not exactly the same, but um, gives you a version of it. I think even better is that book by Coulange called The Ancient City, where you can also read more about this. Um, Salens, uh, where did we stop here? Yeah, lineage as the participation of the ancestor in the bodies and identities of living persons as by the transmission of blood, bone, or soul, is a spiritual condition, Salens writes. He might also have explored the American ritual of transmitting samples by mail to corporations such as Ancestry.com and 23andMe as a way to find lost ancestors and locate ourselves in the still enchanted webs of human kinship. For humans are spirits too, Salens reminds us. When the academic reviews of the new science of the enchanted universe began to appear following its publication a year after Salens' death, I noticed a strange phenomenon. For a genre conventionally prosaic, the scholarly critics kept having encounters with the metaperson of Salence himself. When Catherine Pratt Ewing, a professor of Islam at Columbia University, sat down to write her review at her dining table on a Sunday morning, she suddenly found herself slipping into an almost hypnagogic state in which Marshall was a felt presence, she recalled in HAU, a journal of ethnographic theory. It wasn't a matter of belief about whether this was possible, it just was she writes. Ewing later realized that Salens had appeared to her on the morning of his memorial service held at the University of Chicago on April 3rd, 2022. I kept trying to imagine how he would take my comments, 
the anthropologist Carlos Fausto wrote in another piece for HAU, would he act like a benevolent or benevolent or a mean-spirited ancestor? Ancestors, Salen had Riley observed. Let me just pause here for a minute. Those of you who write about people who have uh, passed on, whether it's a medieval figure or whether it's a contemporary figure who died or whether it's an older figure like Aristotle or Plato, I mean, don't you feel when you're reading them and when you're writing about them, don't you feel somehow in some sense their presence? But I guess it's a question of how literally you take that. Are they in some sense, quote unquote, really there uh, as a meta person or, or what? Ancestors, Salins had Riley observed, are ambivalent powers, usually the most moralistic of all metahuman types. They are needy, even though they are not actually in need of anything, to quote the Swiss ethnographer Henry Junod. At the memorial service, Salins former doctoral student Sean Dowdy gave a eulogy, and he was certain for a moment that he saw Salins sitting in the crowd, carrying himself with a shabby dignity. Dowdy spoke of how the late professor had been appearing to him in dreams. In one, Dowdy walked up the stairs to Salins' house on University Avenue. Salins opened the door wearing his usual navy blue sweater vest, greeted Dowdy with a smile, and asked him how the morning had been going. Guys, have you ever been visited in a dream or in, in your imagination or in some other moment by an ancestor departed or by some other figure? Gosh, I want to just comment on everything here. About the dreams, appearing in dreams, I saw a movie, Nicolas Cage movie, about two weeks ago called... What's it called? You know where he suddenly starts appearing in everybody's dreams? It seemed to me that Salins, ever since his death, was continuing to develop the arguments of the new science in a new way. The book was meant to be a trilogy if only Salins had more time. The scholar Frederick B. Henry Jr., another former student and longtime friend, worked tirelessly to prepare the manuscript for publication. Henry told me how, as he was driving down a highway in Princeton to an early morning appointment, he suddenly realized that Marshall was sitting in the passenger seat. He stayed there for 10 minutes as Henry's hair stood on end and a wave of joy and sadness overcame him. I found myself belly laughing at some identifiable joke he had manifested beside me to deliver, Henry recalled. Salins was inimitably demonstrating his point of the immediacy of the spirit world that ever surrounds us. Can you imagine he writes a book on the immediacy of the spirit world, he dies and then he sticks around to haunt the people writing reviews. It is the flip side behind the mirror of our limited being, Henry wrote to me. None of it need be considered paranormal in the slightest. It is part and parcel of our human condition. I will eventually become a meta person to somebody. So will you. Okay, well, listen, I had never heard of this author before. Salin or Salin. Salins, Marshall, S-A-H-L-I-N-S. I hadn't heard of it until I saw this article in The Nation about a week ago called Meta Person, written by Anna Della Subin. So that's where you can find what I just read, The Nation. Meta person Anna Della Subin, and the author we were reading about was Marshall Salins. Pretty intriguing stuff. I think it could be worth picking up a copy of The New Science of the Enchanted Universe and Anthropology of Most of Humanity. And uh, I have, again, I have authors I read who write about the topic of disenchantment, students who come to me to discuss meaning, enchantment, whether the world is full of gods or whether the gods have fled. So that's something, I mean, if uh, you don't mind, I'll take maybe one or two more minutes here, show you a nice passage from the sovereign individual that, believe it or not, talks about this. Yeah, you see, I'll give you an example. In this book, which I'm reading, because I have people, so I teach online at millermanschool.com. I have courses in private tutoring. I have people who have come to do my private tutoring who are interested in Bitcoin and cryptocurrency more generally, but usually Bitcoin specifically. And over time, they said to me that I should read some of these books, cypherpunk writings and the sovereign individual, because usually I talk to them about what I know better, things like this, Plato's laws, which incidentally begins with the question whether law comes from God or man. First sentence of the book. Okay. But anyway, I've been reading the sovereign individual book and uh, I was thinking about it because listen to this. In this part of the book where he discusses the transition from the medieval to the modern or from the feudal to the industrial age or era, he kind of talks about what you could think of as a disenchantment of the world. Listen to this. The cultural programming of the late Middle Ages encouraged people to see the world in terms of symbolic similitude rather than cause and effect. So the symbolic similitude is like 
everything is meaningful. Everything stands for something else. Everything is symbolic. Everything is allegorical. Okay, wind isn't just wind blowing. Wind could be the touching caress of a departed ancestor. A fish isn't just a fish, okay? A fish could be a sign of your future lover. Okay, so everything is imbued with symbolic similitude. This short-circuited reasoning, they write, it also pointed away from a mercantile conception of life. Thinking in terms of symbolic equivalences does not easily translate into thinking in terms of market values. You see? So it was an obstacle to commercialization. Every occupation, every part, every color, every number, even every element of grammar was tied into a grand system of religious conceptions. Pretty amazing, right? Mundane bits and pieces of life were interpreted not in terms of their causal connections, but in terms of static symbols and allegories, sometimes personifying virtues and vices. Each thing stood for something, which stood for something else again in ways that often blocked rather than clarified cause and effect. Reminder, I'm reading from the sovereign individual. To confuse matters further, relationships were often arbitrarily bound together in systems of numbers. Sevens played an important role. There were seven virtues, seven deadly sins, seven supplications of the Lord's Prayer, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, seven moments of the Passion, the seven Beatitudes, seven sacraments represented by the seven animals followed by the seven diseases in a book sealed by seven seals. Okay, so this question of meaning and symbolization and whether there's the transcendence and the gods have fled the world or imminence and the world is imbued with them, you can't avoid it. It's everywhere. I'm reading Heidegger's Contributions to Philosophy of the Event. It's there because he talks about gods would never enter the kind of world that we've made. But if we follow Heidegger's philosophy, then we prepare the possibility of the passing by of the last god. That's what Heidegger says. Or in the sovereign individual where you don't expect to see it, passage on the transition from the medieval to the modern in terms of the flight of the gods in one sense or this de Symbolize, de-symbolizing, de-allegorizing of the world, well, that's in some sense a disenchantment. But is it progress or is it regress? Or is it something else altogether? And is it true? You know, as things like the people who recommended this book to me, The Sovereign Individual, they're Bitcoiners. And Bitcoin has reinvested their world, from what I can tell, with significance because you know, they talk about Bitcoin as truth, and, you know, the, all of the fervor and excitement of entering into a new era, unprecedented in human history. Fascinating, fascinating uh, topics. Okay, let's do a quick review so you understand and remember, if you're just tuning in, what we covered today. The first article was, By challenging our physical bodies, we may heal our civic ones, published in noemamag.com. Nice article there about the importance of physical exercise and its meaning for duty your duty to yourself, to your family, to your loved ones, to your neighbors. What are you going to do? Your neighbor's in trouble. You have to kick down the door, but you know, you skip leg day or whatever the case is. Um, you know, or you have to pick up your kid and run up the hill to take him to the nearest who knows what, God forbid. Um, so physical bodies and civic duty, that was one. Next was this article on Marshall Salins. If you'd ever heard of him before, feel free to comment on what you thought about that. I was completely uh, ignorant about him before, but I thought it was pretty intriguing. We connected that to a little bit of Plato, a little bit of Sovereign Individual, um, and to Heidegger as well. And I had a third article queued up, you know, but uh, I didn't realize this was going to take us two hours. So we'll save this for another live stream article reading about pseudo-intellectualism and journalism and other, th other articles. I love doing this with you. It's super fun for me. I hope you like it. I'm Michael Millerman. Millermanschool.com is where I teach. I have books on Alexander Dugan and Martin Heidegger. You can find those if you go to michaelmillerman.com or duganbook.com, okay, or heideggerbook.com. I have all of these links, uh, all roads leading to um, things that I have available for you. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, share it if you enjoyed it, comment if you have something you'd like to say. Thanks for spending time together. I hope that you are all happy, healthy, and I'll see you next time.